Uh, hello everyone and welcome to Magma Ridges episode 9. I'm joined here by Pandemonia again and we're going to be discussing some new Ungoro stuff today, uh, especially talking about which cards we think are craftable uh, and which, like how we would rank the different classes. So um, let's start this off, let's get straight into it. Uh, Pandemonia, uh, where would you rank, what, what would you say is like the tier 1 of classes right now? Currently the class I definitely think are the best is wa wa Warrior, Rogue and Hunter. So Warrior it's mainly because the, the, new, the newcomer that everyone thought would be a deck, uh, Taunt Warrior, mm. which is becoming, which is obviously quite strong, especially against aggro. It just seems to shut down a lot of aggro decks because you play a Taunt, then another Taunt, and you just keep playing on curved Taunts. Yeah. <laughs> and pretty much that's how you eventually just beat aggro decks. Uh, Rogue, it's... Uh, Surprisingly, the, the two dominating decks at the moment, uh, it's obviously Quest Rogue, which was kind of kind of an unexpected surprise, but also an, another deck that people thought would be dead after the loss of Conceal is Miracle Rogue, yeah. which has now become a lot more minion heavy, running Sherizard, running the Val, what's it, Valspine? Valspine Slayer. Yeah, and even that ra the, two, the two mana 2-2 two, two that gives uh, you a... Razor Petal Lasher, yeah. yeah. So it's become a more mid-rangey deck as opposed to just an all-out combo, you know, combo deck where you aim to draw your deck and win. It's it's more uh, a slightly more mid-range deck now. I mean, speaking about minions, it's even running, or some lists are running Arcane Giants as well exactly, for like yeah. that extra late-game minion so, because they cut uh, some of the uh, like the questings, for example, without the conceals. You know, they're making it up in terms of like um, minions that can actually win you the game in the form of the Arcane Giants. Exactly. So yeah, it's, it's shifted to an interesting dimension because now obviously you can interact with it and even though people can still have crazy gadgets and turns, they're a little bit less crazy because no conceal. So, you know, you can try, you have to kind of get the value on the turn you gain it. Yeah. yeah. Which is obviously a lot uh, different. But yeah. So those are the three classes I would definitely rank the highest. Obviously some of the other classes are also popping up. It's, uh, I would still say are good. But I mean, I don't know if we're going to get to that. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead. Let, tell us what your rank 2 and your dumpster rank are so so yeah so my mid, mid to upper tier are i put it's quite a large sort of grouping of for me it's paladin druid mage and shaman and so for paladin currently this mainly i mean there has been a bit of hand buff but what what i think has become sort of the better pattern for us has been the mid-range paladin uh there's been two well mid-range slash control it's, you know it's kind of debate we have you know we're having this debate earlier as to you know what makes it mid-range what makes it control yeah and it's there's two main sort of variants the one is running sort of an early game murloc package with valfine and Inquis um Val what's it Val Val Inquisitors. yeah Val and inquisitor and uh, a bunch uh, and obviously different people are running different like early murlocs whereas yeah. the version that i'm currently preferring is the more classical version with Val pyromancers and dirty rats and you know that sort of uh, idea. So, yeah, that, that definitely sounds like control to me, but I'm not going to get into that again. <laughs> yeah, we only, but, yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of minions though, so that's why I'm leaning towards saying it's more mid range, you know. But yeah, uh, the Druid, Druid is sort of in an interesting spot because, like, there, there is a country, there's a viable ramp Druid, although it's obviously very slow, as yeah. you know, ramp Druids are, so it kind of gets preyed on by the aggro decks. But a deck that's also kind of expected that it's kind of seen a resurgence has been the aggro Druid. Um, especially now with uh, Living Mana, and there's been a whole bunch of other really aggressively costed, like your Fireflies, even, you know, just cheap, efficient dudes. Yeah. Uh, then Mage, uh, we saw very early on there was the two turn kill Mage with the Waygate, but that seems to have kind of, or, you know, it's lost its novelty, you know, people are realizing it's really slow, and, you know, sometimes you're just dead before you can do anything. Yeah, it definitely gets preyed on, uh, preyed upon a lot by a lot more of the refined decks. Exactly right. Yeah. So another uh, other mage decks, I think, are doing the trying to do become popular. So tempo mage, it's your burn mage, and even freeze mage. Uh, well, I mean, I'd say that the primary mage decks hit now are pretty much aggro mage and freeze mage. Like yeah, there's the mage, secrets yeah. mage as well, but I'm not really convinced that's a good enough of a thing yet. I don't know if that's what you mean by tempo mage. Uh, no, well, there's sort of there's a like tempo and aggro kind of overlap a bit, but I mean there is sort of there is some tempo there are some tempo mage lists that I mean, are not in 
I think they only overlap in the sense that uh, Agro Mage has uh, mana worms in it. Yeah, uh, but I, I mean, I mean it's definitely not... still Agro Mage to me. And then Freeze Mage, which is also taking on a quite sort of a different approach. Another deck that people thought would be dead after the loss of Icelands. Yeah, has kind, of, has kind of resurfaced in a different, a slightly different form now as well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and then well, May a uh, Shaman. It's mainly the Elemental Shaman, you know, mid range. Where people have either been going like the full elemental route or combining it with uh, jades, you know, the jade cards. So it, I think it's still a bit quite early to say which one's the best or most consistent version. They both obviously have their strengths and their advantages. And then coming to the dumpster tier, we have, well, what, the ones is Warlock and Priest, which, you know, Warlock, Handlock didn't quite have the resurgence I was kind of hoping for. I think a few players tried to make Handlock work, didn't quite yeah. get there. Zoo is still kind of a deck, but it feels that it does lose to, like, it struggles against some of the other tier 1 decks of the meta at the moment. And then Priest, well, Death Rattle Priest, I don't think quite turned out <laughs> as Blizzard wanted to, to. Yeah, as Blizzard imagined. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I definitely agree with you there on Warlock and Priest being sort of d uh, dumpstery tier. First of all, I'd like to sort of disclaimer this by saying that I don't think anything is like truly unplayable, any of the classes. I think yeah. that uh, certainly at the moment, at least, we're in a pretty good place where there's at least one or two playable things from every class. Um, but I'd say that the few decks, I think Warlock's most playable deck is by far Zoo, and I think that's quite uh, weak against a lot of the meta at the moment, as you were saying. So I think that's kind of what puts it in the dumpster tier for me. And for Priest, um, I feel like their decks are very far from refined and also just don't feel like they have powerful enough win conditions for me a lot of the time. Sometimes you can outvalue with your like Miracle or Lyra Priests uh, or Tempo Priest, depending on what you want to call it. Um, and the Death Rattle Priest, Amara just isn't enough of a win condition, I don't think, a lot of the time, yeah. they, except against aggro decks. Um, and I think you did. yeah, so I th I think that's part of the reason I think we both agree that those are pretty much in the in the worst tier, let's say. And I actually think that Druid is kind of there as well. I don't think Dramp, uh, I don't think Ramp Druid is really seen enough results to be uh, sort of good enough. Uh, I think that in a particular meta it might have its place, but overall I'm not sure the deck is really good enough. And so I think that mostly le just leaves uh, Druid with Agro Druid as their main viable deck. And Agro Druid is also weak against a lot of... Um, it's a very all-in deck. Yeah, it, 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 can be, it can be quite weak against a, a lot of decks. So I think that that leaves Druid a little bit one-dimensionally, or one-dimensional. And I mean, we've also seen Jade Druid uh, not be as dominant as people thought it might be. Uh, it's kind of just gets left behind by a lot of the mid-range decks that we're seeing. Um, so I, I kind of think that I would also have Druid in that sort of bottom tier. Um, and then, to me, I think there's only one top-tiered class uh, with multiple archetypes of like viable decks, and that's Warrior. I mean, Taunt Warrior and Pirate Warrior are very, very different decks. Um, so you, you can kind of play the aggro or the control uh, style if you're playing warrior and this makes it very difficult to mulligan against which makes the class pretty strong as a whole and I think there's also even some tempo warrior lists that haven't really been experimented with uh, enough um, but I think that warrior is in a really good place I think warrior is kind of to me the standout class at the moment and then I would say the other uh, five classes hunter rogue mage paladin and shaman all kind of fits in that second tier uh, and to me that's mostly because all of those classes pretty much have one viable or one really good deck. Um, in Rogue, the Quest Rogue is kind of weakish in the meta at the moment. It's good against certain things, but against most things, it's not really that strong. Uh, so I think that Rogue's mostly just Miracle Rogue at this point. Uh, Quest Rogue definitely has its place uh, and can win, but it's not as strong as a lot of people perceive it to be, I think. Um, and so I think that leaves those five classes with only really one strong archetype each um, obviously this is better than we've seen in some previous expansions where like hunter and paladin got totally left behind but um, i think that to me that's the kind of clear divide that we see in the the different classes and i definitely i think i mean if, if people like the innovation in warlock and please continue i think we can we, we are we can head towards a matter where you know we can have all nine classes being 
represented. Uh, obviously, you never. You, it's very difficult to always get equally represented because I think Warrior is still. I think between Warrior and Rogue, they're dominating in terms of the numbers. The the dominating the meta at the moment in terms of the sheer numbers. Yeah, uh, I think I think Warrior, Rogue, and Hunter have seen yeah. the most popularity on, according obviously. to uh, fit the Data Reaper report stuff. Well, not the yeah. report, but the the, the live uh, Data Reaper stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, hopefully, we develop this this developed into sort of a healthier meta, and not just a rock paper scissors meta. Because you know, like the problem is that gets really boring when it becomes a case of okay, this deck is tier one, therefore this deck becomes popular. You know, okay, this deck gets knocked over. Okay, the next deck now that gets played upon. You know, it's really nice yeah. to have a sort of a yeah multi-dimensional meta. I think that there's definitely something out there for whatever playstyle you want to play. Uh, yes. And I mean, that's relatively important, right? To keep uh, people happy, to have it so that there's something viable in every different kind of play style. Um, and I think that we're in a pretty healthy place at the moment. I think the meta is still going to take a lot of settling. I think this was a huge change, especially with yeah. a lot of the cards that rotated out. Both the Hall of Fame cards, it was the first time we've seen that, and obviously all the other cards that went out from Standard I think into the Hall Wild. of Fame, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm honest, I think the Hall of Fame changes actually... Like obviously new cards coming in and the gold cards going out was expected, but I think the Hall of Fame actually shook up decks a lot more because, you know, it's not a case of oh you we have these four back guys to build skeletons of decks on. It was a case of all of a sudden you have gaping holes in your decks that you know all of a sudden Azure Drake isn't there. All of a sudden yeah, yeah. Of all, so I, I think the Hall of Fame affected the meta and things a lot more than you know just the natural rotation did. Yeah, I think it definitely probably had a bigger effect than most people realize. I mean, even on something like Agro Shaman, like maybe Agro Shaman would be stronger or more viable uh, with even just Azure Drake still being in the meta, even if we still lost Tunnel Trog and um, Totem yeah. Golem, right? Because maybe we could have made up for that with having a little bit more draw and a little bit more fuel, but the, the deck kind of lacks that kind of thing. So, I mean, there's a lot of examples uh, where Azure Drake like makes mid-range druid decks better as well and we're those have kind of fallen made off. Every deck yeah i made jade <laughs> jade like it's a big missing piece for jade druids too as well like the spell damage plus the draw is huge for them um so yeah i mean it's definitely um definitely i think those hall of fame changes have been uh, a very big impact and even like you know like we're saying it's also it's forced people to rethink you know how am i going to build freeze mage how am i going to build miracle rogue you know, it looks like you know there were enough try hard, there were enough diehard fans to keep <laughs> those odd tops going. You know, I think I saw laughing post because he's obviously one of the most notable freeze mage players in the world, and he was like, ha ha ha, I always play freeze mage, and I think he was one of the pioneers of sort of the current freeze mage lists, which running, you know, the archaeologists and the Medivh, uh, the the valets, I believe. I think the freeze yeah, mage yeah. now runs. Yeah, well, I mean, the archaeologist is such a good card, but yeah. anyway, yeah. Um, so speaking of good cards, that's the perfect segue onto our, our next section, which is uh, what cards we would suggest people uh, can craft. So this is uh, uh, going to be specifically focused towards um, players on a budget. So this is not necessarily all the cards that are only in top tier decks. And if you if you just want to play like if you want a net deck, play the top tier decks. Just craft these cards. Uh, they're always going to be in top tier decks. These are more cards that are always going to offer you value. Uh, sort of irrespective of your collection size, right? Uh, cards that can offer you value, especially if you play the classes, uh, that they're going to be just good, versatile cards, right? Um, yeah. for, for most of the cases. Uh, but without further ado, let's get on to the first one. So firstly, speaking of Mage, I'm going to uh, kick this off with discussing Primordial Glyph. Uh, to me, Primordial Glyph is probably the number one card for crafting. Um, even though you might not play Freeze Mage or Aggro Mage or Quest Mage, which are pretty much the three decks we see this in. Well, actually, we see this in every Mage deck, but even if you're not yeah. going to craft those, um, this is a card that is going to be playable in uh, a lot of budget Mage decks, which is one of the easiest classes to build budget decks for because of the power of their um, the classic cards. cards. Yeah, the classic and basic cards. Um, especially their basic spells. And this is a card that's definitely going to help you be more versatile, help you uh, win games out of nowhere. And it's really strong with stuff like Sorcerer's Apprentice, Mana Worm. I mean, those are cards that have been around for a long time. Um, you know, those are, are classic cards. So I, I don't see this card uh, necessarily going anywhere until it hit, hits rotation, right? This is always going to be a strong card for Mage. Uh, I think even going into future expansions. Uh, definitely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. 
I mean, for me, it's, it's kind of sort of obviously it's a little bit reminiscent of your un, your unstable portal, but the fact that you get to discover it is obviously yeah. so more such more powerful, uh, much more powerful in terms of the versatility it offers you. You know, and like you say, the, the last thing about cards like these is it also gives if you as a player don't have a full collection, you can then discover cards you don't have. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you get to wield the power of a power blast or a you know whatever uh, spell yeah. you don't own. Yeah, and I mean, getting those eight mana power blasts, or those four mana meteors, or those five mana flame strikes. Even if you're not you're not playing them the same turn, you primordial glyph. Those are definitely powerful effects that you can keep. And I think it's also a good card for newer players to help them help teach them about like when cards are good, right? So sometimes they might pick, oh, meteor is the biggest, the most expensive card here. Let me pick it, and then uh, they pick it against a deck where meteor is never really good, and then you know. It, it ha can help them learn lessons as well. So I, I think that it, Primordial Glyph is just a, a really, really strong card. And I think definitely something worth crafting for newer players. Uh, so do you want to take us on to the next card? Which is, would be your next card of, of choice for players to craft? So for me, and we, you know, we said a bit about this, uh, 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 we said a bit about this, but my favorite card by far of the set is Elise, uh, or Trailblazer. Yeah, Elise the Trailblazer. So, so obviously it's a legendary, but in terms of the rest of the neutral legendaries, none of them are really that impressive. And yeah. even a lot of the class legendaries aren't seeing that much play. You know, obviously the quests are seeing play here and there. But for me, well, why I like Elise so much is because it's essentially like a 71, like it's you know, sort of value. The fact that, okay, you play in a 5 mana 5-5, five, five, then the pack, and then when you open the pack, you get 5 cards, all of which are in, like a lot um, increased rarities. So the fact is... It's, it, you kind of for a short period of time in the game you're increasing your collection because yeah. you, know, you, you get to essentially play cards that you might not have in your collection so it's obviously much better in a slower meta against control decks where you have time to you know explore these different options you know where you get big guys or you get to play these cards I mean it's obviously not as good against aggro where you might be dead before you can even get the pack yeah it's but just it, the versatility and the value yeah at least does have good stats for its mana cost as well right so okay. even if you don't get a uh, to playing the pack, it could just be good, sort of on curve, right? A it's a far five is not the yeah. best, but it's not the worst. It's a card that's easy enough to fit into a lot of decks, right? And with the five yeah. drop slots not being that, like you know, it's not just a Zerdrex now. There's a lot of space <laughs> in that five drop slot, yeah. so I think Elise can fill a, that hole in a lot of decks. Um, you can play sort of anything from mid range to control to like super grindy uh, decks with the Elise. So I think Elise is probably one of the top legendaries. I would say second behind another one that we're going to discuss soon. Um, but I think Elise is probably the best neutral legendary. Uh, yeah. As you said, like I, there's just not that much. The rest of the neutral ones are quite like very niche, gimmicky, very niche or very gimmicky. Yeah. Know? And as of yet, I have yet to see any of the others sort of a place in any deck really. Yeah, I think this is a, just a good card to go in almost any mid-range deck as well exactly. for... This is like the rag, uh, I mean obviously not as powerful as rag, but the sort of, when you don't know what card to put in, let's just put in a strong card. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just a, a really good value card that can fit in a lot of um, decks and often just win games uh, off the value that uh, the players get from their pack, right? Um, and even when you don't draw the pack, as we said, it is a 5 mana 5-5, five five, which is not terrible, you know? Also, a slightly sort of on a, like a slightly similar note, the whole educational aspect of you also get to, and I'll be honest, you get to see and discover some weird, wonderful interactions you would never have thought of because you know you because the pack is a pack, it, it gives you cards from different classes yeah. as well. So you get to sort of see, oh, this card does this with this card, and you get to sort of you know learn a bit as well. You know, yeah, you get to realize just how bad some cards are as well. <laughs> exactly. When you get Tyrantus and you're like, oh wait, actually this card is really bad. I'm never having a turn where I can play this card because yeah. it does nothing. <laughs> um, or, or but I mean, yeah. I mean, I agree. Also, just as you're saying, the pure like fun aspect as well. Like yeah, that's definitely exactly. a thing, right? Opening that pack and it's going to be a different experience every game. So if you're limited on a collection and you, you can't change decks all the time, this is one way of uh, having <laughs> like very different experiences, you know, and still being strong but not overpowered. Yeah. Um, like yeah, it's not like overpowered RNG, but it's it's really fun RNG. Um, exactly. The way they've done it. And for those that don't know, the packs are sort of a lot more weighted than the real packs you would open. You're a lot more likely to get multiple legendaries even or no, yeah, like epics and stuff. I've got and an epic in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of the packs I've opened in-game. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Okay, so uh, on to the next card. We sort of briefly hinted at this, and uh, this is the one other legendary that I would say is uh, a good craft in this set, and that's Fire Plume's Heart, the Warrior Quest. I think the Warrior Quest, uh, if you have like a mid-sized collection, you can actually put together a decent Taunt Warrior deck, is uh, a strong card to craft. Uh, there's a lot of ways to build the, the Warrior uh, Quest decks, e everything from tempo to control, um, to like mid-range even. Uh, and so there's a lot of ways that it, you can make this card work. You don't have to have the exact uh, net deck that Sho took to rank 1 legend or whatever. Um, there's a lot of ways you can build to make this uh, effect still like, or to, to complete the quest and the effect is always pretty powerful. Yeah, and there's, I mean, and like you said, there's a lot of sort of budget, cheaper taunts that, you know, like obviously, obviously you might not have all the expensive epics and legendaries, but you know, cards like Sentient Shieldmaster are still solid. You know, uh, like a, a, a card that used to be, uh, I used to enjoy when I was still a budget player was uh, Sunwalker. You know, it's, yeah. you, you know, it's a lot of cards that, you know, might not see, might not be, let's say, in tier one decks, but they're still pretty solid and, you know, in a, in a taunt warrior that will still do the job quite effectively, I think. Yeah, and it, it also synergizes well with uh, another card we're going to discuss a bit later. But um, what? Yeah. So, what would your your the next card that you would suggest players can craft be? So, I mean, so now we start moving towards like you know, are you a sort of a, a more aggro player, or are you sort of a more you know control player? So, like, uh, or you know, do you like synergies and tribes? So, like, if you like synergies and tribes, one of the things that obviously Blizzard announced at the beginning of this was uh, when they spoiled was the whole elemental synergy and so one of the, th the one of the things they've done is even though there are some class specific um, elementals they've kind of kept let's shall we say the core package as yeah. being mostly neutral so um, I'm, we're going to kind of group all these cards blaze caller uh, servant of kalamos and the tova stone shaper i believe it's called yeah and then obviously the co i mean we don't really talk about the commons but like talk creeper also kind of fits in there as well yeah. And these are all basically really, re really well statted and really good effects for cost uh, value value minions. With the o the main condition being you have to have played an elemental the previous turn. Yeah. So I mean, Blaze Caller has been most like uh, compared to it's it's like a f uh, a Firelands portal except you're guaranteed a six six. Yeah. Uh, you know, as opposed to a random five drop. Um, Servant of um, Kali Moss is basically uh, similar to there was the mech one I can't even remember Gorilla Bot I think it was called or yeah I yeah. mean although I, I feel like it's more similar to almost a Zerd Drake in, yeah. in yeah, no, no, these no. decks you can get a lot of I mean a 5 mana 4 5 but the, the discovery effect is obviously very strong I yeah. mean these games where I've got a second Kali Moss or a, a Earth Elemental you know especially in, depending on the class you can get some quite powerful elementals yeah and then Tolva Stone Shaper is sort of quite a, a strong four drop in the fact that it's it's actually if you activate it it's a sentient shield master with divine shield which is a very good tool against aggressive decks yeah so, yeah i think th those are definitely the key like uh rare and up cards because uh, we're only really going to talk about rare and up mostly just epics and legendaries um and those are definitely probably the three key cards uh that you would want to craft to play any kind of elemental deck, you know, across different classes, as you're saying. I mean, mostly we see elementals in Shaman uh, and a little bit in Mage. And th those are definitely cards that if you want to build the elemental package in, in almost any class, if you're just trying to fulfill your quests, uh, those are like uh, decent cards that are going to win you a few games. Yeah, they're definitely. Yeah, so I, I mean, I definitely agree. Blaze Caller in particular is, is a, a, a big, um, he's a big boy. And he can do, uh, uh, he can have like a, a large effect, right? Dealing five damage means you can basically get removal and development in the same turn, and that's a very powerful effect. Seven mana for a six six, and I mean a lot of times you gain two or three for one. But, you know, you get a lot of value from it. Yeah. So I mean, and, and we all know Fire Elemental, even that was a shaman card, is, was is one of the best class cards. Yeah. So. And this is his bigger brother. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, um, and next off, uh, one of my favorite cards from the set, uh, and one of the cards I was uh, a big fan of before it even released, uh, is Vilespine Slayer. <laughs> so I think if you're a rogue player, 
Uh, Valspine Slayer is pretty strong in almost all rogue decks. I mean, it doesn't see much play in uh, Quest Rogue and that kind of thing. But I think you could build a Quest Rogue deck even that would make Valspine Slayer work. Uh, it's just a very, very powerful effect. Uh, on that so same theme of developing whilst uh, killing, on, um, in, in this case, Valspine Slayer is more guaranteed to kill if you can activate the combo, of course. Um, whereas the... Uh, the body is a lot weaker, right, than like Blaze Caller, where in this case you're getting a lot more, uh, you're getting a more powerful effect and weaker stats when Blaze Caller, the effect could be limited in what it could kill, but the stats are pretty good. Yeah, I mean, Vast One Slayer, yeah, like you say, I mean, it's it's kind of the, the a card a lot of rogue decks have been wanting for a while because, you know, the weakness of mini decks, is most notably Miracle Rogue in the past, was. They couldn't deal with big threats. You know, the, the the closest thing to an answer they had was, you know, sap it and hope to win before that that big threat becomes a a problem. Yeah. Whereas now this is, I mean, this is as hard to move as you want, and I mean it adds the body as well. So a lot of the a lot of the rogue decks are becoming more tempo orientated, I think, and a lot more mid rangey. And obviously, I mean, this is this is an assassinate an assassinate on a body. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of rogue decks you can build with this, right? I think everything through from aggro to, like, control rogues can be played with Vile Spine Slayer. Even if you're playing some kind of, like, Jade Rogue, uh, this is a powerful card for uh, that deck, even. Be exactly. Just because the combo effect is so strong. And even in, like, an aggro rogue, you can use it to get through taunts to push damage to face. So I think if you play rogue and enjoy playing rogue, Vile Spine Slayer is definitely worth crafting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then next, I think we're going to come to one of the cards that, that you mentioned before on the, the taunt theme, uh, Stonehill Defender. Uh, Stonehill Defender, I'll be honest, I was a little bit surprised at how well it was doing. I mean, it basically was, uh, you know, it's a silverback patriarch with upside. Yeah. And the fact that obviously people <laughs> a, get... A big, uh, it has to be a big upside to make up for being a silverback <laughs> patriarch. <laughs> yeah, because silverback patriarch, you know, I mean, in, if anybody who's been playing since the beginning, a 3 mana one for taunt. I think saw zero competitive play. Yeah. You know, it, it did not see play. Its stats were so poorly distributed. It, you know, even the fact that it was a beast didn't help it. It was just really a bad card. But now all of a sudden we have Stonehill Defender, which adds one extra line, and all of a sudden it's a really powerful card in, over, you know, several different classes. And now we ask ourselves why. And obviously, the, well, the simple sort of reason is because you discover a taunt. Yeah. And now depending on which classes you play in, and we know discover favors class cards, so. The the, the 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 classes that this has found homing have been main well have been paladin because the potential to discover cards like Tyrion and Sunkeeper to are really powerful and even uh, Wick of Flame Burn Bristle exactly yeah it's, it's really I strong. mean a lot of the paladin legendaries at this point are are taunt exactly as well as in Warrior with the taunt Warrior where it's basically just continues the the train you know the, the as well as the, the, there being quite a lot of quite a few strong uh, new taunts. I mean, there's the that warrior what one eleven for seven. The tarlord, yeah. The tar, you know, there's a lot. There's some, and some obviously some of the taunts you are running in your deck, but to get an extra taunt that could possibly fill your curve is obviously very powerful. The ability, you know, you play this on turn three, you can go. You look at your hand, you see they're going. Okay, now when I'm playing my curve, what do you know? What turn is the most awkward currently? Okay, what what ter you know what cost taunts do I have? Oh, oh, I've got a five drop. Oh, I've got a seven drop. Okay, I'm missing a six drop. Oh, look, there's a six drop taunt. You yeah, know, it, it's it's a, it's a very useful card for this. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I think especially uh, as we mentioned, if you are making like a makeshift taunt warrior deck, maybe you don't have all the taunts that are in the top tier deck. Stonehill Defender can be a great uh, stock gap. It can help you okay. discover those top tier taunts, or it can just provide you essentially two taunts for one card, right? Yeah. Uh, you, I mean, Stonehill Defender will count for himself because he has taunt, and well, I mean, towards the quest, so, and yeah. uh, will also the minion that he discovers obviously has taunt as well. So that's two minions for one card, right? And Which is really powerful. Yeah, that means you can fill your deck with other uh, useful cards you might have, like uh, removal or um, AOE just effects like brawl. <laughs> yeah. Or just uh, other good value taunts, right? And you can get your quest done earlier, which if yeah. your deck is overall weaker, the finishing your quest earlier might well be uh, a stronger wow. play. Exactly. So, yeah. And then, I don't know, do you want to talk about the one, the, the last one, we, we, you know, we're talking about that's kind of been, obviously, an aggro player's dream, 
Yeah, so uh, this is Bittertide Hydra. It's the 5 mana 8 8 beast uh, that uh, was sort of snuck in last, like revealed right late into the, the reveals. Yeah, really. Uh, it was basically, like, cool. with the. Die. <laughs> yeah, basically with the last set of things, and a lot of people noticed it and uh, kicked up a bit of fuss about it. Uh, it struggled to find a great home at the moment, um, but it's definitely a powerful card that if you want to play a lot of aggro decks, if that's your style, uh, Bitter Tide Hydra can be slammed in everything, pretty much. It's been slammed in everything from Pyro Warrior to Hunter to Druid. Druid, uh, tried it in a different deck. Even basically. Priests that run the like silent stuff, I've seen it uh, shoved in there. <laughs> So, so yeah, five, you know, yeah, five and eight, eight is, is, is quite strong. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's definitely a card that has a lot of potential to win you games. Obviously, the downside means that occasionally you will lose games, and the risk might not be worth the payoff in like a lot of top tier decks, which is why maybe you don't see it played by uh, all your pros and in all your tournaments. But it, it's a strong card that if aggro is your play style, uh, maybe even if you love something like Beast Druid, which hasn't really seen much play. Uh, a better tide Hydra is a very strong card. You know, it has the beast tag, so it has the natural synergy there in Hunter and Druid, and also, obviously, as we were discussing, the stats are just really good for the mana cost. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's basically very reminiscent of Foul Reaver. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is the, by far the easiest card for those of you who play, who play GVG. Foul Reaver was the five mana eight eight that basically every time your opponent played a card, basically you lost three cards from your deck. Yeah. So, and I think this, I honestly think this drawback is nowhere near as bad. Uh, it's obviously debatable. It you depends know, on the decks and stuff, yeah. Yeah, but, decks, but yeah. yeah we, we, won't, we won't go into that too much. Uh, there's just one more card that we uh, briefly discussed, and that's uh, Shadow Visions. Yeah, well, uh, Shadow Visions, it's, yeah. once again, it's, I think it's the reason why it's good. It's similar to your Primordial Glyph, and even all the Discover ones where the whole idea well, okay, well, this one you still have to have the card in your deck, so it's a little bit not sure. as versatile, but the fact that it's essentially a third copy of any card in your deck. Yeah, I think it, it's definitely a very fun card as well. Um, a lot of the Priest decks that have it in, maybe not necessarily that strong at the moment. I mean, we discussed that we don't really think Priest is necessarily that great, but Shadow Visions is definitely a fun card that can lead to a lot of really weird um, moments, you know? Uh, you find the removal you need. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you find the board clear you need. So I mean, it's still got versatility as a tutor. It's the closest thing Arsene has to what we call tutors: the ability to find a particular card in your deck. Yeah. So uh, it also synergizes really well with Elise. If you're playing Priest, uh, you can oh, find yeah. the Anguro pack. So if you're just playing some Priest deck uh, and you crafted Elise, well, you, if you really like Priest and that's your number one class, maybe Shadow Visions is worth it as well. There's a lot of gimmicky things you can do with that where you discover the pack and you just get all the value. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I think that's all we really have. Uh, this is gonna this is a, a relatively short episode compared to some of our others. Uh, once again, if you have any comments, uh, please let us know. Uh, you can uh, contact us on Twitter or you can leave comments on the YouTube uh, VOD. Uh, let us know if there's anything you want us to discuss in uh, future episodes or if there's any other cards you think we missed out that are worth crafting. Um, just let us know your thoughts overall on uh, the podcast, anything else you think we can improve or uh, work on. We're always uh, open to you know, any feedback, so you know, please let us know. Uh, any other shout-outs or call-outs you want to do? I'm, just, I'm really glad that, you know, Gora, obviously this is always the case of a new meta, but you know, it's been fresh and interesting and exciting. You know? And I, I really hope that the meta stays as diverse. So what you're saying there is shout-out to Blizzard. And uh, you're calling out Reddit for being uh, so angry all the time. <laughs> <Yay. laughs> okay, no, no, no. We, we, we better not piss off Reddit, right? Yeah, they're, they're uh, Reddit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, yeah, so that's everything we have for tonight. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. And please like and subscribe as well to uh, help the uh, channel grow. Thanks a lot. Cheers.